Thanks for listening to A Long Time in Finance with Jonathan Ford and Neil Collins in partnership with Briefcase News, the service that brings intelligent curation and analysis to your media monitoring. Perhaps you've heard of Bill Gross, or maybe the name rings a bell. Perhaps, if you're an American, you might even once have had an investment in his total return bond fund. Many people did. And for years, it was the biggest fixed income bond fund in America. Amassing nearly $300 billion in assets and making Mr. Gross an exceedingly rich man. In one year alone, he took home $300 million in pay and bonuses. In 2002, Fortune magazine crowned him the Bond King. And he was named Fixed Income Manager of the Year on multiple occasions by Morningstar, whose awards are apparently the investment world's equivalent to the Oscars. Unsurprisingly, perhaps all this went to his head, and in 2014, after what can only be described as some very strange behaviour, his employers, the German insurance company Allianz, gave him the bullet. But we're always interested in oddballs and innovators on a long time in finance, aren't we, Neil? We are, yes. Now I'm gagging to know more (laughs) about the background of the 2014 firing. (laughs) So we thought we'd do an episode looking at Bill Gross, his rise and fall, and his impact on the fund management world. And who better to introduce us to this strange world than Mary Childs, a presenter on NPR's Planet Money, who spent almost a decade researching the man before publishing The Bond King about his life and times. So welcome, Mary. Hi, thank you for having me. I suppose we should start by talking about why gross is important. Many UK listeners will only be dimly conscious of who he is, other than perhaps if they remember his famous pronouncement in 2010 that UK government debt was resting on a bed of nitroglycerin. But I think your argument is that Gross changed how the investment world thought about bonds. So perhaps you can start by telling us a bit about him and how he did that. Absolutely. Yeah. So when he arrived at, uh, he actually started working at a, just a kind of lowly, kind of buttoned up insurer when he graduated from business school. And bonds were not really a thing that people traded back then. It was more, you know, you had your very steady eddy investments and they paid you a coupon. And at the end of their life, they paid you the money back that you had lent out. And that was the beauty of bonds was that they were so reliable and you could kind of predict based on your assets and liabilities what your future would look like as an insurer. So that was like, why would you mess up that great system? And Bill Gross was like, because it could be fun and very profitable. It was really just chance that they were into the idea and gave him a little puddle of money to play with. And he started investing it and having a really good time. Now, of course, you can't trade bonds by yourself. So this was sort of at the dawn of this moment. He wasn't alone in this in this beginning, but he did kind of, he became the best and over time really carved out this niche. And I feel like his personality is imprinted all across the bond market, the way people operate, the kind of aggression, the, you know, not that aggression is unique to Bill, but but there is this kind of hunting for loopholes and searching and and this comfort with gray area and understanding of all the mechanics within a bond. Like this is how you excel in the bond market. And this is how you make those extra basis points above and beyond your competitor. You talk about him uh, being a kind of aggressive uh, risk taker. Yeah. Is there anything in his background, you know, which I mean, I, I looked looked up a bit of uh, the biography on the internet and it points out he's a, a Vietnam veteran professional blackjack player in Las Vegas. <laughs> Can you give us a bit of color and and also give us a sense of what time period we're talking about? Is this the 70s, the 80s? This is the 60s. Yeah. So Pimco was founded as a as a fund, as a kind of company shell corporation within this larger insurer in 1971. And I think by then they had already kind of gotten up and running a little bit. So we're talking about the 60s. He did go to Vietnam and he did go to Vegas to count cards. But I will say like both of those sort of overstate the case a little bit, like absolutely those things are true. But he has written himself about his experience in Vietnam, kind of just being far from the action and being scared and being, you know, he was on a he was in the Navy and he was on a boat and kind of just like that was as close as he got. 
And he feels guilt about that. And he feels weird about that. So there's a lot going on there. Sort of, It's an interesting kind of from a risk perspective. <laughs> but then in, in Vegas, you're exactly right. He went to Vegas for a couple of months just to see what he could do. He had read Ed Thorpe's book. Who is Ed Thorpe? Oh, who is Ed Thorpe? Just the best. So Ed Thorpe is this investor and mathematician. When Bill Gross was in college, he was a Duke and he got in a car accident his senior year. And he ended up like a bad one. His scalp became detached from his head. Yeah, not pretty. So he's in the hospital for like a long time. And he gets his scalp reattached, luckily, which will spark a lifelong obsession with how his hair looks and also like physical health. But he picks up this book by Ed Thorpe. And it's Beat the Dealer. And he's interested. It's telling him that he there's a way to count cards to basically get an edge over the casinos and make more money when you're playing blackjack. And he's like, well, that's fun. And he's got a deck of cards and he's sitting there and he's playing. He's doing hand after hand. And he's like, okay, I mean, this works in the abstract, like when I'm by myself in this hospital bed. And so then he decides later, I'm going to just try it. He goes to Vegas and I think he starts with $500, not all of which was his, and turns it into 10 grand over the course of three months, which he later would acknowledge is actually a terrible ROI, given the amount of time he was spending. <laughs> Risk yeah, adjusted, exactly. that's certainly true. <laughs> when he was standing for like so many hours a day, like it was pretty miserable. My theory is that that gave him this sense of like this intuitive sense of risk and when to feel, you know, it's you have the Kelly criteria and you have all kinds of ways to like know and measure mathematically, statistically what's going on on the table. But at the same time, like, there's a meta level to that where you learn physically how it feels when you have the edge. So when does he bring in his brilliant idea about trading bonds rather than holding them? And is his idea that rather like Ed Thorpe's card counting, he can kind of bond count. So it's a kind of riskless enterprise where he's just scooping money off the table without any real risk on behalf of his own investors. Okay, so Howard Rakoff goes to Bill Gross's boss and is like, hey, man, I got this great idea. We got to be trading bonds. It's going to be amazing. And it just so happens that at the early 1970s, inflation, you may recall, was rampant. This was a great case to get rid of your bonds. This is kind of Howard's pitch, is that you have these bonds sitting in a vault downstairs, but as inflation is eroding the value of them. They're just sitting there getting less and less valuable and you could do better. You should buy new bonds, sell those bonds to somebody else who maybe has a shorter time horizon or like really likes that company that issued them or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Buy new bonds. Like you don't have to just sit there. That idea is pretty compelling, right? Like that just makes sense. And Bill Gross's boss was like, I don't know, man, we got this good thing going. We're an insurance company. We're not trying to take crazy risks here. (laughs) Thanks for your time. But I've got these young upstarts that might be interested in talking to you. Why don't you go meet this young man named Bill Gross? Mm -hmm. And the rest is history. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You think that essentially it was his ability to have a sort of instinctive understanding of risk and probability that uh, allowed him to prosper here. Do you think that is, was connected in any way to his Asperger's? I do, yes. I think that analyzing markets and market trends is just his comfort zone. Later in his life, a hobby would be basically charting the market for stamps in a way that I think no one else had done. What, like things posted Like stamps. Yeah. you lick it and you yeah. put it on an envelope, yeah. Like Mr. Ponzi's idea. Charles... <laughs> So, yeah. Ex- yeah. And like this idea is that like his, his conception of it was like these things trade these things. Some of these things, if you choose them right, just like bonds, they have value and they're going to yeah. do better over time. And if I check the provenance and I check the last time they traded and when they went up to auction, da, 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 and he basically would chart that against like the S&P and figure out, OK, this stamp is doing really well. This stamp is poised to outperform. And like no one else was doing this is what he did for fun. So he found in Vegas that his ability to hyper focus was like a superpower and that he could look around at all these other people that were like having fun and like drinking and like playing these, you know, various game machines and and different card games willy nilly with no real strategy. He was like, this is incredibly sad for you, but great for me. Mm, Do you think that was his philosophy? little bit yeah i mean he told me he told me that like he would look at them and be like i hope you can pay your bills like you're getting duped you're like you're a fool i have a strategy i know what i'm doing hang on this is a gambler who disapproves of gambling yes he's full of contradictions that's the beauty he built this huge fund 
did he do it because nobody else had noticed what he was up to? Or it's just that he was better at it than anybody else? Yeah. Ugh, I love this question. I think it's both, honestly. And they're the same in a way, right? Like sometimes being early and right is all it takes. So I think he was a better trader and remains so. He's been having a great little tear lately. Was a better trader than many of his peers. And the kind of statistical, careful analyses of replicable strategies helped contribute to that and helped kind of buffer through the times when he made big trade calls that were wrong. I think those two things going together, like he was just much more comfortable getting into derivatives before anybody else. He was more comfortable going international before anybody else. He was more comfortable just moving into areas that other people like, I don't know how he had the like mental elasticity to do all of this. And just like, like he just was excited about new products and and new frontiers and would always want to be right there on the cutting edge. And that helped other people are like, I don't know. Let's see how it falls out. Let's see what goes on here. And Bill Gross is like, okay, we signed up all of our like extremely stodgy, extremely risk averse pension clients for derivatives before anyone else is. And and that was wildly profitable for them. I mean, there's a logic there, which is that there are, you know, new markets. In Absolutely. There probably is a first move. There's an advantage in that, you know, things are not efficiently priced. Quite. And then everyone crowds in and it gets less fun. And then we move to the next thing. Yeah. When, do, when does the world first sort of go, oh, who is this? Apart from obviously Mr. Rakoff, who's sitting there thinking, where's my <laughs> cut or whatever, after all right, these right. years of success. I think he did but, okay. Right, I where... think he did pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> when does the world first kind of go, oh, who is this fellow, Bill Gross? Yeah, in America, there was this this show called Wall Street Week every Friday night. And it was extremely popular. And it was kind of like, you know, you would come home after a long week and like find out what happened. And Bill Gross got himself to be the bond guy. So he's up there next to Peter Lynch. He's up there next to other luminaries in finance explaining what happened and explaining how the bond world works to people. And he's like the only representative from that world. That wasn't like mainstream necessarily. That's like people who it's called Wall Street Week. It's still people who care about that, but it was like the show. And so that was like, he put himself on the map with that. And then he kind of reinforced that with his monthly investment outlooks, these monthly missives that would start with this like often bizarre personal anecdote, like way oversharing <laughs> and then pivot hardcore into the bond market. I went to the dentist and it was incredibly painful. And that is what is happening in the bond market today. (laughs) But this creativity was like a little unheard of. And people loved these things. People ate these investment outlooks up. Okay. But the real answer to your question is 2008 when PIMCO outperformed. No, I I thought it was interesting in uh, 2008 that he's invited to help the US Treasury dealing with the banking crisis. Presumably at the same time, he's got this in massive portfolio that uh, presumably he's not going to trade that against the advice he's giving to the US Treasury, is he? Presumably. Although it does sound to me as though he is in a pretty privileged position. And I would say there's a clear conflict of interest here, but that may just be my naivety. Well, I think he would say that he always talked his book like he always had in his portfolio what he believed in. Now, when did he stop believing in it? That's an open question. Maybe it was 10 minutes after the conversation where he told you to buy the thing that he was holding. But I think information asymmetry is part of the bot market and is an important part of it. And I think you would be derelict in your duties to your clients if you didn't take full advantage of that. Yeah, but, yeah, but hang on. <laughs> if you're advising the US Treasury at the I'm same sort of time, kidding. the Fed is the biggest gun in the, in the world. And yes. well, you're, you've got to be careful. You're turning you've around to... and saying, well, I advise you to do this. And meantime, I will bet against it in my bond fund. Luckily, he actually happened to do the opposite, I think. In the kind of advising the US government, he more or less was front running more than betting against. So that at least is a aligned oh, interest. That's, that's hang completely on. fine. So, How on. could you argue with that? <laughs> so he he he, he, okay. he he shorted the stock and then told the <laughs> told running? the told the treasury that this was <laughs> grossly overvalued and is going to have to. And fall. that's just his opinion. He's doing it in the market. I, I like I like your I mean, concern for the protecting the investor interests of the U.S. Treasury. That sort of defenseless well, no, I'm not widow saying. and orphan-like organization. No, I, no, Absolutely I think, true. You know, what if, else can they do? If, if, <laughs> it seems pretty outrageous to me, I have to no, say. No, I agree. Okay. I'm glad <laughs> it's not just me. No, but I think in the in the crisis, there was so much going on in so fast. And this, this was one of the things that we just didn't get that mad about. Like, we just, we were mad at Goldman. We were very busy being mad at Goldman. And like, Pim goes out here, like, Bill Gross is overtly saying, like, 
shake hands with the government, buy what they're going to buy it, but buy it first. And like saying that out loud, saying that in a public investment outlook, like nothing was confusing. It was all there. People get touchy about this subject, but like it was all out in the open. And like, maybe we should be mad about that. Maybe it was kind of ripping off the US government on yes. behalf of PIMCO total return clients. And like, is that bad? Yeah. I mean, I have to say, I have to say, I think the US Treasury has basically got to look after itself if it gets into conversations with Mr. Gross during a financial crisis. The idea that somehow they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, I and see. And they were having their wings pulled so, off by this puny. So they said, geez, Bill, what do, we, what do we do about what about what do we do about these Treasury fives? And he'd say, oh, well, they're grossly overvalued. If I in my view, I happen to be short of a few. Uh, OK. <laughs> okay. But that's just having the courage of your conviction, right? Like, what is he supposed to not trade just because he's talking to the government? This is what we built. Like, there's always going to be a moment where the public and the private intersect, no matter what. And we built one where he's like, yeah, let me just tell you about my investments and you can do the same if you'd like. Here, yeah. have some. But that's the world That's the world in which he inhabits, one where everyone's trading, people are winning and losing. But what Neil has been hammering away at does touch on, that there is a side to the growth story where people say he's not just some sort of um, morally neutral, ethically neutral card counter. He's kind of playing kind of quite aggressively close to the line. Do you think those charges are fair? Give me one example of what you think he did, which was a little bit close to the edge. That's an easy one because the SEC did the work for me. Now, PIMCO, certainly in the settlement, I think they did not admit or deny or whatever. But there was an instance in the more recent history where, you know, post-crisis era, where they had launched a new ETF that was supposed to track the total return fund. An ETF, exchange traded fund. An exchange traded fund, yes. So a more access retail accessible version, the shares of it trade daily, and it discloses its holdings. Like there are a lot of different things that are different. It's more tax beneficial. It's like also very much at the time the cool thing. And Bill Gross loves the new cool thing. So they're launching this ETF. They wanted to do well. And I think Bill Gross more than most people appreciates the importance of timing and a good start. And <laughs> you can just go read the That's SEC's so take on the situation. But what did they conclude? I love that I built so much suspense. Yeah, That's yeah. after the break. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll be back oh, on that God. So, okay. They had figured out that there was this sort of fluke in a pricing mechanism and a pricing system, this like external third party pricing system that they used for mortgage backed securities. Mortgage backed securities, when they start out, they're like 100 cents on the dollar. Here's a nice, beautiful round lot of mortgage backed securities that's so pretty, it's perfect. But over time, people prepay their mortgages or they default or whatever, whatever. And so over time, that little pool of mortgages starts to get shaped funny because things are coming out of it and people are like leaving the pool. So over time, they get degraded, right? They kind of like look weird and they're like more difficult to analyze and they're not the pretty whole lot that they once were. And those are because of that extra difficulty in analyzing them. They're called odd lots and they trade at a, at a discount. Well, let me say somebody figured out that if you put that odd lot into the pricing system, it didn't know about pricing it as an odd lot. It didn't know about that discount and it just priced it as a round lot. So you get like a nice little boop. Anytime you just drop your new little odd lot into the pricing system, you're just it's going to round up basically. And that looks like performance. <laughs> But isn't, so I, but isn't, isn't straight, out, straight out of the big short, really, isn't it? To your point about whether it is or is not actually performance, PIMCO, I think, would argue that they did indeed manage to sell those securities at those higher prices much later. So take that as you will. Okay, mm, but the okay. bonuses were paid um, immediately. Could, <laughs> could, <laughs> so yeah, the, absolutely. So the, so the shareholders had to take that one on trust. <laughs> yeah, of course they did. Can we talk about what happened in 2014? And why and how he fell out with his employer and his colleagues. Because it seems behavior. extraordinary to me. Did he change his behavior? Did they change? Did the rules change? Such a good question. I think none of the above, honestly. He and Mohammed Alarian, who was his then co-pilot and supposedly heir apparent, were just different people in such fundamental ways that there's a strong argument, I think, that they would never have been able to negotiate their working relationship and that it was kind of doomed. Bill is like really intense and like he doesn't really care about manners and he wants to know what the trade is. He wants to like drive forward. Very like hyper-focused on the details guy. 
Muhammad is a macro guy. He wants to talk about like changing winds between central banks and da da da. And like, it would be like, well, what's the trade? And the, <laughs> like, they're just not having the same conversation ever, you know? And then like, that's just their <laughs> market perspectives. Their personalities like interacting with each other are violently different as well. From the sort of personality type you've described, do you think he was the sort of person who could ever accept the idea that he might have a successor? I know, right? Because some of the things like him phoning up a, a journalist, obviously he's a very media kind of friendly sort of person or maybe not that friendly from time to time. But but he phones up and he says, I know you've been talking to Mohammed El Arian because I bugged his phone, which seems to me to be a kind of kind of slightly mad thing to come out that with was to a, a wild journal- one. journalist. Yeah. But so what's, what's going on here? Is he just nuts? Uh, That was the question in 2014. That was absolutely the question. And people within PIMCO were asking that. People within PIMCO were asking if he was, you know, suffering from some kind of mental decline. I think he just (laughs) felt trapped. I think he was acting out. So Mohammed announced he was leaving in January 2014. It just like really hit Bill hard. He acted much more like it was a divorce than anything else. And he kept reliving it. And he made the exec committee like think about whether or not like what we could have done differently in terms of like, should we have handled this this way? And they're like, bro, we got to move on. We don't need to keep relitigating Muhammad's departure. Like we need to run the company. We need to figure out what's next. Did they decide that uh, if he didn't go, they would? At a certain point, finally, yes, it became clear to a couple of the others on the exec committee and kind of in in upper management that like this was untenable and they couldn't continue on, like they couldn't do their job of running the company and like investing the money because they were so busy just dealing with the constantly shifting sands that Bill was, Bill was just like orchestrating these kind of difficult moments and and constantly flip-flopping on his own succession. And it was just too much, I think. Mm. So he then left and went to Janus the two-headed the monster face, face doesn't know <laughs> doesn't know which way it was facing really either up or down and it's uh, subsequently merged with Henderson a UK outfit and has sort of carried on down into the disaster zone really i mean what on earth was he doing there it's hard to repaint the moment from 2014 the the picture of what was actually like what people were feeling at the time because Bill Gross was this larger than life person in the bond market. Whatever he said moved the markets. Anything he said moved the markets. And no one knew this was coming. Outside of PIMCO, I covered PIMCO full time. I had a root canal the day before. Like I did not know this was coming. <laughs> don't schedule your root canal. Just don't have a root canal if you're a beat reporter. Like people were like, oh my God, the, the entire Brazilian government debt market is supported by PIMCO because Bill Gross likes it. What will happen to Brazil? People were absolutely thinking that billions and billions Billions of dollars would leave PIMCO immediately and follow Bill wherever he went. And we know now that that's not the case. But I don't know. There was this moment where real government officials were calling around being like, is this the seismic market upending event that we've been worried about? Bill Gross leaving PIMCO. It could have been. They seem to have traded it really well in-house at PIMCO and like managed those outflows in a way that like probably spared us all a lot of pain. And also clients were kind of just like, I don't know, I guess like he was going to go one day and now this overhang is removed because he's gone. So, <laughs> But his behavior yeah. after he leaves seems to be very strange. I mean, I hate to come back to behavior, but <laughs> how, he, how he tells people about how his cat watches him when he gets in and out of the shower and... There's sort of all sorts of, you know, marriage breaks up. I mean, is this all part of a kind of grieving process uh, that he's working through after he leaves Pimco? I just have to correct you that the ode to his dead cat, Bob, was actually while he was still at Pimco. Okay. It was that year, though. So, like, you're not wrong. Ode to his dead cat. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I mean, sorry, I've missed the dead cat bit. I thought dead <laughs> dead cat bounce was the only. That's what no, happens. No, no, in, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, this okay. Is not a bouncing right, cat. Okay. Honestly, I haven't talked to him about it with the benefit of like so much time. Like the conversations that we had were largely in 2017 when he was still at Janice and still kind of like going through it. So I would be curious now what his perspective is, just having kind of gotten a little bit more distance and created a new life. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like it was just one thing after another. The Muhammad thing was so destabilizing for him. And then he had this kind of referendum on his personality in the press that I think he did not expect. And then clients didn't follow him. Like he built his whole life on this like one metric of performing well for clients in total return. And then like, where's the loyalty? No one comes with him. Like, I mean, a couple people did, a couple clients, but it was just, I can't imagine how devastating that would be if you build this empire and you think it's 
And it is on your talent and your brand and your abilities. And then nobody's loyal. Like, oh, for someone specifically like Bill, that would be devastating. That was devastating. I must say it's a bit rich, isn't it? Him expecting loyalty from his clients when the whole thing is predicated on a sort of quasi-mathematical approach, an entirely cold, emotionless analysis. Uh, he's expecting them to follow him because, of they, because they love him. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> well, there are a few moments of cognitive dissonance in his kind of worldview in this, I think, that I honestly made him the best protagonist for me. Like people are suggesting to me now that I write a book about this, you know, finance hero or that. And I'm like, I don't always see the same like intellectual, psychological, like personality nuance and like agita. And there's just, he struggles and he struggles publicly. And I think there's something so beautiful and accessible about that. And like, obviously as a writer, it makes it very fertile ground, but he wanted to be loved. And the really weird thing is that he wanted to be a famous bond manager because he wanted to be loved. The bond managing was in service of becoming famous, which was in service of being loved. Good Lord. Gosh, that's, that's, that's rather soppy. <laughs> I must um, say, I was going to say. Sorry, everyone. Very Is soppy. this uncommon for your podcast? You don't always talk about this? We like no, soppiness. We no, don't I get think you should it, pull but, yourself together, but actually. Anyway, we are. Okay, that's, that's, that's. <laughs> <laughs> it's so beautiful. Know, isn't a dry eye at this end. That was A Long Time in Finance with Jonathan Ford and Neil Collins. Production and editing by Nick Hilton. And our sponsorship partner is Briefcase.News. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review it on your podcast app, as that will help new listeners find us.